morning. We are in uh, chapter 11 of Malachim Aleph. This is the third shear of this chapter, but uh, the source sheet, as you'll see, will say that it's uh, part two, only because it is the second source sheet. Uh, I don't want to belabor the point and uh, spend the whole time still turning over in our minds, which we could spend the whole time uh, processing again and again. Wait, Shlomo HaMelech, this great king, the zenith, well, essentially the zenith of Jewish history, uh, in terms of all of the goals of the Jewish people seemingly having been accomplished, uh, arrival in the land of Israel, kibbutz v'nachla, the uh, conquest and the uh, apportionment of land, uh, setting up leadership, uh, building a Beit HaMikdash, obviously, and the idea that the Jewish people with Shlomo HaMelech as the uh, corporeal king, Hashem is their divine king, but Shlomo HaMelech as this font of wisdom that aside from all of the uh, military, economic, and political power that they wield, there's the cultural power, the in power of information and knowledge that they're able to share with others. And as we'll see today, we're going to move ahead a little bit. We saw last time we started to, we tried to understand in part one um, and part two of this, uh, of this chapter, um, what went off the rails, what was the good intention that ran amok, and um, we saw some of the dynamics also inside of how um, Shlomo Melech is rebuked by a Kodesh Baruch Hu and told essentially that in a reversal of what happened to his father, where his father was not Zoha, did not merit to build the Beit HaMikdash, but I'll have the Nachat, that his son will build it, and that there is a promise that for all time there will be a uh, a Davidic line in Shlomo HaMelech's rebu the rebuke that Hashem gives Shlomo HaMelech uh, in verses 11, 12, and 13. You can read it for yourself. We saw it last time. Um, Shlomo essentially told, well, I won't renege on my promise. Number one, it won't be during your time. It'll be in your son's time that you will have something torn away from you. The same theme again of the tearing away of a cloak, the tearing away of something. Uh, and it's actually described that way. And as some pointed out last week, and quite accurately so, there's a parallel here to the world of Shaul, from Shaul to Shlomo. But unlike that case, unlike that case, um, the reality of the promise of the Davidic line remains intact. And so what Hashem is doing is saying, okay, you'll have still a Davidic line. It's going to be, relatively speaking, relatively speaking, a backwater in terms of its influence and its sphere, sphere of influence and... Um, uh, all of that, it's gonna, that's, that's all gonna fall by the wayside and it'll be, you know, sort of on your account. Now, why didn't Shlomo just get punished immediately? Why didn't Hashem just say to him, okay, you're done. I'm, I'm removing you tomorrow. Yeah, I, I, I impeach you, all right? Remember who else is in the story? He's not in the world, but he's in the story. David Hamela, the legacy of David. If in the lifetime of Shlomo, there's some repudiation of Shlomo, if things fall apart for Shlomo or Shlomo's um, uh, reign during the period of the, of, the, of his own lifetime, recall that the legacy of David was being secured by the reality of Shlomo successfully building the house and ultimately, according to the Midrashim and the Gemaras, opening the doors of the Mikdash for uh, the Aaron Kodesh to come inside, not in the Pshat, but in the level of Medrash that uh, the Chazal described uh, that they don't open. And they'll only open once the name of David HaMelech is invoked, even in verses 11, 12, and 13. It mentions uh, um, the uh, idea of David as a prominent feature, the person, but the legacy. David Avdi is how he calls him, uh, uh, and uh, for the sake of Yerushalayim uh, and the like. So that's where we're holding. Let me pause here. I'll take some questions, comments to close out that facet of what we're talking about. And then I want to see inside uh, to uh, uh, Midrashim, which will lead us into the rest of the Perak, verses 14 and onward. And uh, let's see if at least we can get uh, uh, farther in the Perak, not the whole Perak, at least uh, a good chunk of it. Okay, Shelly has her hand up. Go ahead, please. Okay. Um, the, when we get to verse 14, we don't have a response from Shlomo. Yes. Uh, Saul says, uh, David says, Khatati with, uh, with the Oreo stuff. Uh, Shaul says, Oh, but I, I didn't do anything wrong. I'm giving this to, to I'm giving, I'm sacrificing yeah. to God. I'll kill this guy later. So I, I didn't sin. Okay. We don't have either response with Shlomo until we get to verse 40. 
Yeah. And then verse 40, he's, he's, do, he's doing exactly what Shaul did to David. Uh, I'm going to reserve judgment on that comment till we get there, if that's okay. Your point is well taken, but wait till we get there for that. But on the first point that you made, I think that was the next sentence I was going to say, because you're exactly, but Baruch Kivant, and uh, let me give you credit. I thought of this idea after you, I'm sure. It's a silence. What we're going to see next is Shlomo simply does not, at least the level of shot here, there's no response. And we're left with a big question. Here his father laid down the path as the great Baltruva of Kalal Yisrael. And when it comes to Shlomo, even in verse 40, by the way, just on, on, in terms of this issue, there's no, there's no speech by Shlomo. He doesn't do anything in, by way of speaking. And the question is, why not? Where is it? What happened? What, wh it's a cutoff. The next thing we're going to hear, just, you know, you know what's coming. He passes away at the end of the parak. It's That's it. No response. The last thing about Shlomo HaMelech's uh, 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 interaction uh, is uh, Hashem speaking to him. And we don't know. We simply don't know. And uh, well, as we discussed last week, part of the discussion among the Anshe Knesset Agdolev, who metunim bedin, be judicious in your judgment, one of the first things that they adjudicate, uh, so says Avotar Rabbi Natan, and I brought it to you from Rav Meidan's uh, iteration, understanding of that Avotar Rabbi Natan, which I think is actually what it said, but he, he found he put it, puts it together very beautifully. There was a, a question about whether his works should be included in the canon of the Tanakh, not because they're not special, amazing, fantastic, <coughs> etc., but because there's a real cloud hanging over the end. We like a good ending. We like we like the ending where in the end, everyone does tshuva and they come back and and that doesn't seem to be clear. Now, does that mean he didn't do tshuva? Or does that mean the tshuva is just not mentioned? Or is there somewhere else where we have something where he recognizes like, I've done wrong or I, I didn't, um, you know, I didn't, um, I, I didn't get to the, 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 whatever the word is. I, I didn't get to the spiritual journey of, of my, of my father. I made a mistake that I don't believe can be fixed. Um, and now why did he despair? Couldn't he have figured out a way to just say, I, I make penance before you. Sefer Tehillim was already written. So was he reading Sefer Tehillim for himself, like at his bedside, there's a little Tillamal, and his father wrote it. So is that, is that what happens? Um, and uh, why didn't he, uh, you know, figure, figure it out? You know, if, if he had a rabbi, he didn't need a rabbi, but if he had a rabbi, don't you think that the rabbi would have told him to tshuva, you should uh, maybe some fasting? How about confessing publicly? How about, um, I don't know, how about doing something that's going to show us that, uh, and, 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 and your, your, for posterity, I mean, not that they're necessarily thinking that term, in those terms of the word posterity, but how, how, how's this going to go, right? Uh, if we just leave things, whatever the word is, um, undone, maybe is the word, uh, you know, just just without uh, without 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 fixing it, and and could there be a tikkun? Could there be a tikkun? And and it sounds like there there should be a tikkun of some sort, um, but but what, but we don't find one. Hold that thought. I'm going to come back to it though. I don't, I didn't just set this up just for the sake of of putting putting ideas in people's heads. I want to want to talk about it a little more in depth. Someone had a question, comment. Hello. Yes, no. I do. No, hi, hi, Helen. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Aaron does not respond to the death of his children. He's silent. He accepts it. Right. And then we have a thing where we can enhance Shtika Kohodoya. It's a very weak argument that somebody just in their silence acquiesces or understands their punishment or their disengagement. It's kind of a weak argument, but it has been done before. So, and, there, and therefore, and therefore? Therefore that he is so overwhelmed with regret, remorse, and not 
doing the job right, that he is struck with silence. In other words, he possibly. can't say, he has nothing to say. Right. He has no defense. Mm. I mean, I think it's rather weak, but it's a possibility. I mean, ju just just to push back on that, just to, to think just to like think about it more, you are saying something, but but in Judaism, we say there's always a road back. There's something you could do. You could you could do tshuva, and here's a process. Right. And, and and who wrote the book on it? David Amelach. Why don't you start right. with "I'm sorry"? I, for, I sinned. Excuse me. I sinned. I sinned. And then say "I'm sorry." And then say "I want to make it better." And then say "I won't do it again." And then say "I'm going to fix it." Right? All of these things right. that that maybe you can still. Uh, he should have done. He could have, should have, and could have. Could have, right. Avala, let's say, let's say, it simply didn't. Uh, it, it but didn't you know, through the, through it, 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 we have, we have a lot of weak arguments that people of good standing have given back very weak arguments about their transgression. Even Abraham saying that or as a sister, all right. along the way, there have been weak arguments in defense or no defense. Okay. I, I don't want to go down. Now you're bringing, bringing yeah. me to like Avraham and the speeches that happened between the, the conversation between them, et cetera. Let, let's, let's, let's stay away from that, yeah. but let's, but let, okay. but, but we should, we should focus on, 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 on this idea that there is, there is a, there's, there's something missing. There's something we were looking at it. We're just scratching our heads. How could it be? He didn't say anything back. He didn't say that. Hashem, I, um, I, 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 I did wrong before you. I, I, how could I even stand in your side? You could have pulled out to heal him. Uh, I don't know. To heal him. Nun Aleph. Leif Tahor. Barali Elokim. Ruach Nechon Chadesh Bekir B. You know, uh, you, you you created me with a pure heart, and uh, please renew this the spirit within me, right? And uh, give me this pure heart. Give me this, right? You you, you understand? He, he could have said that. He didn't say any of that. Rabbi, we do have God's response to His silence, though. The, the God's response to His silence is going to start in verse fourteen. God is not pleased okay. by. Okay. Right. Please right. Okay. Well, we get we're. We're 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 get we're get we're getting there. We're getting there. Yes, for sure. Wait, Faith had a question in, in person, so let me give her an opportunity. Please go ahead. Isn't the maybe he ran home and wrote the last verse into hell? Oh, oh. Uh, now Faith has just given us the key. Faith just gave us the key. We couldn't uh, hear her. Uh, Faith, Faith just said that maybe he went home and he he wrote the last verse. I'll say last verses. Of the book of uh, of Kohelet. Hmm? Hmm. Nice. Maybe there's a book where he went home and at the end of it, he realized, "Hey, you know something? I um, I learned a lesson here. It's a very hard lesson, and I can't. Um, I I might not be able to fix this as I as I thought I could because I realized that my wisdom has taught me something." About uh, truth and consequences. Now, in person, guys, we only printed the, we only printed one page. But uh, I'll, let me share on the screen. I'll skip to the the end of the source packet because I probably should organize it better to put that in there uh, right off the bat. Um, but just just look on the screen. Look at the last two verses. I'm, I'm gonna read them out loud. The last two verses of Kohelet. It would be it's not here. It's on it would be page three, but it didn't show up. We got one and two, but this is page three. Sof davar hakol nishma. At the end of all things that I've spoken, all the things that I've said, you should fear God, keep his commandments, right? For this is the essence of the human being. Now, when we're in shul, when we read the Megillah, Megillah Kohelet, that is the last verse that we say. We all repeat it out loud. But actually, when you look it up in the Tanakh, that is what we repeat, which is not the last line of Kohelet. It's the second to last line in Kohelet. Look, in, look if you're holding a Tanakh, a Koran Tanakh, you could look it up. You can see it inside in the book of Kohelet. And it's staggering because a lot of people think, well, that's the last line, but it's not the last sentence. There's another sentence that comes after it, 
which may be the key to the mystery. Page 884, if you're using the older edition of the Koran Tanakh Hebrew English, chapter 12 of the book of Kohelet, some call it Ecclesiastes, the Ecclesiast, the one who gathers. And you look at verse 14, right? Is this sum of all things, everything being said, after I've said all of this, I've gone through this whole journey, uh, which he wrote, according to Chazal, the sunset of his years of his life, the last sentence is not Sof Devar Nishma. It's the second to last sentence. But what's the last sentence? Ki et kol ha'elohim yavi b'mishpat. Everything that the person does, God will bring into justice. Meaning, I'll call ne'elam, even that which is hidden, im tov v'im ra. Mm-hmm. And it becomes almost as if, almost as if, the lesson of the world of David HaMelech is very much about a lesson about, and I'm oversimplifying for the purpose of, that's what happens when you generalize, but it gives you at least a framework, okay? So don't kick, kick me with like, wait a minute, we know five other Gemaras that contradict this. I get it. I'm just, but think about this idea. The world of David HaMelech is the world of tefillah, and the world of tshuva, which is the world where you think there's a decree, but if you appeal to Hashem, it can be overturned. The world of Shlomo HaMelech is the world, and again, oversimplifying, not of the lave primarily, but of the rosh primarily, of thinking, of the logos, of cognition. What did he ask for, if not chachma, right? Now, Again, you could catch me 800 times because, and, and these are not atomized divisions. It's sort of like Lahavdol, uh, as Chazal say. I say Lahavdol because this I'm saying, and I might be totally wrong, but what Chazal say is, right, the Mida, the attribute of Chesed of Hashem, bound up with Avram Avinu. So does that mean Yitzchak didn't do Chesed, Yaakov didn't do Chesed? No, 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 that's not what it means. But it means that the paragon of the attribute of Chesed in the world, represented by, personified in this individual Avram Avinu. Yitzchak Avinu, Gevura, mightiness, strength, hold, withholding, uh, uh, inner strength, etc. right? The Gibor is one who can hold, withhold their desire, their need, right? So, Lahavdol. But David, he wrote a Sefer, which is all about the world of the heart, but not any kind of heart. The heart where it's a heart filled with shuva and tefillah, and that's the legacy that he leaves. Is a safer call to Hillam. Now go to the books of Shlomo HaMelech. The first book is certainly about the heart, but it's not about the heart of um, the utilization of the heart, meaning the world of tefillah and teshuva of overturning something that is happening in the world. It's about channeling passion towards the relationship of Rebona Sha'olam. And that's why it's an allegory. And that's why it's not meant to be read simply and exclusively Lo'olenu on the level of Pshat. The level of Pshat is important. It's crucial as a baseline, but in order for us to understand by way of analogies and allegorical description, what is Mishle though, if not about the world of the Seichel? And what is the world of Kohelet, if not Seichel plus experience? You know, again, I'm oversimplifying. I understand that. But I want you to see it through that lens. And maybe, maybe, and it's more, um, uh, you know, a hypothesis, because, I mean, I, don't, I didn't see it written in a Sefer, so it means maybe it has no bearing in reality. Shlomo HaMelech realizes, yes, I'd like to be like my father, the world of tefillah and tshuva, but my world is a world that is governed so much by the world of the realm of the rational. I understand that there, there are consequences here that maybe for all of my tefillot, holding my father's tilamal and at whatever I'm doing my chuba process, I deserve what's coming to me. And I have to just accept. Now, is that because he gave up? He despaired of chuba, Or is that because he had a feeling that maybe things were set up in such a way that even if he personally did chuba, which I have no reason to believe he didn't do chuba. Maybe he had already set in motion a series of events that were going to cascade that he could no longer control. And that even all the tshuva in the world, he did not merit its unraveling. And let me show you what I mean. Go to the page, page one of this uh, source sheet. Uh, that's, that's for faith, not for you. But 
uh, oh, wrong, uh, wrong thing over here. Where are we here? Uh, share screen, this one. Okay, but go to the top and let me zoom in so everyone can see. And I missed two chats and I'm sorry about that. It's Kohel at his response. Whoever iPhone is, Barasha Kivanta or Kivant. I don't know who iPhone is who typed that in, but you're, you're right. And that's what Faith had said and good. And, um, and uh, Larry, I, I appreciate your point. Maybe Shlomo science is an element of his weakness and being human. Could be. Uh, remember though, Tanakh does not shy away from telling us about the human frailties of our avod and imahot and uh, of our kings and et cetera. That doesn't make them any less great. Sometimes it is what makes them even greater that they have human frailties. But where we're left with something that's unresolved is we expect that in the, on the level of shot, it's going to be like a rising above that, whatever the failing was, whatever the mistake was and what have you. So did they fix it? Right. So I would say by way of analogy, David Amal does tshuva. He does do tshuva. And he, he's the ultimate Baal tshuva. But was there not tremendous suffering, unfortunately, that he endured? Things were set in motion in a certain way. And uh, one thing cascaded to the next. Just think about the progression with each of the children where he has suffering and so on and so forth. Karen, you had your hand up. Let me, uh, please go ahead. There we go. Um, you know, I've been thinking about not just Shlomo, but Moshe, because both these um, leaders were described with superlatives. Uh, Shlomo was the wisest that ever lived. Moshe was the humblest that ever lived. And yet, because they're human, this is to, to Larry's comment, both of them had mistakes that, because they're human, okay? So Moshe hit the rock, even though he was the humblest, he still got frustrated and he hit the rock. Shlomo, the wisest that ever lived, still took a thousand wives and did all of these things because even if you're the best human right. of anything, you're still human. So that's the lesson that I take away from this is that, you know, we compare ourselves and think, I'm not going to be ever as smart as Shlomo, but it's okay because humans... We're measured by how many times we get up, not how many times we fall down. And and any 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 right, excellent. Yep. So. Yep, that's great. Oh. Okay. That, you hear it? Okay. All right. <laughs> great, great points. Great points. Uh, Shelly, another comment. I'm sorry. Go ahead before we open the. Oops. The Oops sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. I. I don't think anybody's being tough enough on him. And I think that the next verses are going to prove it. But also, let's go back to Ezra when we were learning Ezra. And what could Shlomo have done? He could have gotten rid of the foreign wives. He could have gotten rid of the, the um, their houses of worship. Um, Ezra, in, under Ezra, they have to get rid of their foreign wives and, and, and their children. And the people then say, oh, we did wrong. We did wrong. We did wrong. And they listen to Ezra. Shlomo is saying nothing. And the silence is what causes God to set into motion this stuff. Well, Shlomo could have at least done a better job of raising Rehavam so that he doesn't do what he does later on and makes things worse. It, he doesn't seem to, he, he seems to be running the kingdom and not caring about his family at all. Put it down. It's easy to blame, blame the parents, you know? <laughs> and it's, e it's easy, but there's so many other factors at play. And let me, let, 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 let's, let's look at, at a few of these other factors that were, that were uh, involved uh, in this, but your, 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 your points are well taken. And, uh, and that, that's the, the way in which Tanakh is not going to shy away from this, is what happened, and this, is what happened, and this, is what happened. And we're not going to mince words and pretend like it doesn't, uh, it doesn't, uh, exist. Debbie, you had your hand up. I'm sorry. I didn't see you before. Go ahead. Debbie, just unmute. I don't hear you. Yeah, I just, I just put my hand up. Oh, I was trying not to to respond, but I have to. Respond, because that's a discussion. If, if, all of, if all, the whole purpose of the Torah is to teach us as humans with our frailties in situations that we encounter um, with Hashem's help, how to respond. So they can't all be perfect. And they don't, uh, the, the variances 
um, especially between David and Shlomo. There are know, some they're, important ones. They're there, they're there for a reason for us to learn and do the best. You were just starting to say, you always kind of start what I want to say, but yeah, he was more concerned with his own, just like in 2022, we could all be only concerned, especially with the pandemic and who knows what else is going Hi. on. In so yeah, this to me is, they're not going to be perfect and we don't, Hashem, it's not supposed to be perfect because we're supposed to be learning. Uh, yeah, the problem is when we're learning so often, you know, we're learning painful lessons. Yes, we're uh -huh. learning painful lessons. Uh -huh. I mean, that's 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 a reality. And, uh, yes. you know, uh, I, I heard from a few people after after last week's shear, like, I don't get it. This is Shlomo HaMelech. Like, that's that's what happened to him. How could it be? How could it be? And the uh, Taka, it's a good question. That's but th th that's why we're left with this this idea. And and and, and as Karen pointed out, Shelly pointed out, like Moshe Rabbeinu, he hit the rock after the whole career. That's what happened. And then Hashem didn't uh, didn't let him into Eretz Israel. The whole story. Yeah. Zo, zo. Anyway, so uh, look, we're we're uh, we're caught. We're caught. If you hold your finger here on chapter 11, you should probably see the Pasuk inside in the book of Kohelet. And you look in the book of Kohelet, uh, uh, back to Kohelet again, I'll tell you the exact uh, page citation so you don't have to be too crazy. Chapter 2 in the book of Ecclesiastes, already in chapter 2, verse uh, 2, right at the beginning. He realizes, it's page uh, 876 in the Koran Tanakh, Right? I, I said with regard to uh, 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 laughter, right? That it's, 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 he, and, and it's a mehulal means like um, that also like something uh, empty, but, but I don't know how he translates in Quran, like, like craziness, crazy. Uh, it's mad, right? It's loud, it's mad, right? And, and about Simcha, like, what's it going to really bring me, right? Like, it's, 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 it's insane. is is meaning it's, it's, what is it going to do for us? Nothing. Won't help us. Won't help us. So on those words, the Medrash Tanchuma, it's the first source. Probably, I should have given you that. That's like the, the line before the Medrash Tanchuma. The Medrash Tanchuma is trying to unpack. The Medrash Tanchuma has a, an explanation as follows. Amar Rabbi Acha. Amar Shlomo. Shlomo basically was saying in these words that, you know, that laughter is, is, is insane. It says, Dvarim shesocheket aleh amidat hadin hololim. Things that the, the attribute of justice is, um, is, 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 is laughing about, come back to this, hololim, there's madness in it. What does it mean? And when we read the next lines, Medrashan Chuma says, well, look at all the prohibitions that we saw this already inside, right? Chapter 17 of Devarim. Lo yirba lo susim, lo yashiv, right? Don't, go, don't have too many horses. So what does it say, Malachim Aleph? He had 40,000 uh, different kinds of horses. It says he shouldn't have too many wives. What does it say, Malachim Aleph? 700 wives. It's, and then 300, uh, right? And the 300, uh, the Sarot and the Pilakshot, Pilakshim. It says he shouldn't have too much gold and silver. What does it say? He took the money from Yushalayim. It was like stones. And nobody, uh, you know, and uh, no, nobody was, uh, was, uh, was, was, was stealing them, right? So everything it, it, that, that was written in the Torah, uh, uh, that uh, the Midar Hadin, Shesocheket Aleh Midar Hadin, everything that the attribute of justice plays around with, meaning that it tells it to us, but it somehow gives us the reason, it seems to be, if my understanding of Tzimchum is correct. But, you know, basically, Hololim, ah, don't have to listen. He didn't listen. Got the better of him. And by the by, the stones of Jerusalem are, uh, you know, the silver is like stones in Jerusalem. You know, nobody's stealing them. Nobody needs to. The bottom fell out of the market because everyone can get whatever they need whenever they want it. So, Amar Abiyosi Bar Chanina, Hayu Avnei Eser Amot, Avnei Shmon Amot. There were stones that were 10 Amot and stones that were 8 Amot. Right? I mean, they're huge stones. The stones themselves, very large. Tanur Rishimon Bar Yochai. 
אפילו משקלות של ימי שלמה של זהב היו, even though the, the scales themselves, the tools, were made out of gold. How do we know? And כסף נחשב ימי שלמה למאומה. Fine. The second half of the Pasuk, ולשמחה מה זו עושה, for the same verse from Kohelet, what does שמחה do? אמר לו הקדוש ברוך הוא, מה האתר הזאת בידך? רד מכיסאך. What is this crown on your head? Get down from your throne. באותה שעה, in that very hour, ירד מלאך בדמות שלמה וישב על כיסאו. This is, if you remember, it's, it's a callback to something we learned together months ago. Remember when he was looking for the Shamir worm, there's these Gemaras. I don't want to open that up again, but remember what happens that there's sort of some kind of a, uh, what is it? A, de- a decoy Shlomo that comes around. A demonic version of Shlomo takes the, takes the, the, the throne, right? And we were trying to understand, what does this mean? What is going on? But what does it mean here? Again, we're learning a Medrash. We're not learning the Pshat. It's like Shlomo became a man possessed. People looked at him and said, that's not the Shlomo. We don't recognize him. If you remember that Gemara, already then, they, they're trying to understand who is this. We're trying to understand who he is. Where's the real Shlomo? Remember, the real Shlomo comes back to the throne room. In this Medrash, which does not contradict the other one, it's along the same lines, there's a sense that we have with regard to Shlomo. Who is this? Who's on the throne now? The Medrash continues. By Shlomo He was a beggar. And where was he going? He's going to Shul. He's going to shul, there's all the shuls about the matters in Shalim, but Omer, and he, what was he saying? Now listen to this. Ani Kohelet, Hayiti Melech Al Yisrael Birushalayim. How could you open the book of Kohelet now, not realize? Ah, wait a minute. Chazal understand the book of Kohelet is now the recognition of what the Havel Havalim was. Of what the schok and the and the simcha mazu osa? What was it? So all these things that he did, because he understood the Torah better than anybody else, so to speak. That's what we thought. He understood that he would not fall into the traps of human frailties and weaknesses and the like. And he was he would be smarter by half. He'd figure it out. But what happened? Hashem sent a malach. Again, it's not the pshat. You have to understand it. If you want to take this literally, and, and this is actually what happened verbatim, be my guest. I can't argue against you definitively. But I see another pathway here also, which I think is more the path, let's say, of my Rebbeim, and the path also of talking about Rishon, the Rambam Ude Imei. A new, a new spirit inhabited the Shlomo, if you will. That guy on the throne, that's not the real Shlomo. We, we can't, it doesn't match our image of, what, of everything we understood about him. So you know where the real Shlomo is? He's going door to door and nobody recognizes him. And what's he therefore saying? Like a refrain, I'm, he didn't say Shlomo. What does he say? I'm Kohelet, Hayiti. I used to be the king, Al Yisrael Shalayim. Omrim Lo, and they said to him when he got from door to door, Shlomo HaMelech, Yoshev Al Kis'o, Vata Yoshev Mishtate. Shlomo is on his throne. You're insane. You're just a guy walking around saying that you used to be the king of Israel. It's great. The other guy's the imposter. You're the imposter. So what did he respond? Aniko Helet. I'm really him. You just, you don't realize. I'm, I'm the real Shlomo. The one on the throne, that's the imposter. That's the, um, the doppelganger. Mina Shamayim. Vayumakin Otavakana. They beat him with a reed. They gave him essentially grits to eat. They gave him from barley, some kind of... Porridge, eat. Also, a passage from, say, for Kohel, for all the time I start looking it up. But this, this is my portion from all of my straw, all of my toil. Some say he held a reed in his hand. Some say he held his plate, like his, his bowl, seeking food. He was holding either the scepter or the line of his dominion and walking around. He's wistfully saying about the schok, right? I'll be mesachek 
with the Torah was a big mistake. And the so-called simcha, everybody has everything they could ever want. We've achieved some kind of, you know, um, I was going to use the term, but I think it's fraught with religious meaning. So I'll, I'll stay away from it. We've reached some kind of world of, a, an identic world. I use our, our terminology, you know? So, so uh, but he realized it's not me. So what does he leave us for posterity? According to this rendering, he writes the book of Kohelet wistfully, not just as an older man with experience who had everything, the garden, the women, the wine, the whole business, the money, da, 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 the power, but a man who's looking almost retrospectively at the ruins of what his actions have, have brought about. Look at the next, the next matter, Vayikra Rabba. Right, and here we're starting to transition into what's going to be happening further along with Yeravam. So it's a little bit skipping ahead, but just to see this inside. Amarav Yudin, Kol Otan Sheva Shanim Shabana Shlomo Beit Hamikdash Tol Shata Behenyayin. The seven years that he was building the Beit Hamikdash, he didn't drink any wine. He didn't want to be inebriated. The whole thing was an avodat kodesh. But Kevin Shabana Beit Hamikdash, once he built it. Once he'd achieved his, his heart's desire and his dreams, the Nasa et Bat Paro, and he married the daughter of Paro, according to his matters, it happened at the same time. They finished the, the wedding ceremony, if you will, right after he, he, was, he was there at, doing the inauguration of Ben Mikdash. And that night, Oto Halayla, Shataya, and he drank wine. Vayusham Shte Balizmi Ot. There were two great, uh, blizmaot really is, bluzma is a kind of a, a sweet, but apparently also somewhat uh, sharp wine. It's pungent and sweet at the same time. That's, so, so, so I looked it up in, in, in the Jastro Dictionary, full disclosure, and that's, that's what it told me. Some spicy wine of some sort. Um, so maybe spicy, but, but there's some element of sweetness to it as well. So it sometimes applies to like great simcha that's going on. Great simcha that's being experienced. Two of them. The same night. Achat simcha lebinyan beit hamikdash, the achat simcha lebat paro. Two joys: the joy of the beit hamikdash and the joy of marrying the bat paro. Again, the whole debate we saw already a number of times inside is that because he's happy that he married her, there's something just lowly going on. Loshon Znut, something promiscuity, something like that, or is there something much greater going on? He converted her in either case, but maybe he didn't convert her just for that reason. He converted her Davka L'shem Shamayim, and he was Megayer her, and he's bringing her closer because she's the key to the to the Egyptian Empire, which is still a very important force in the ancient Near East. And if if she goes with him, and he can convince her, so what's going to happen next? Maybe he could get the entire world to be engaged in a more spiritual pursuits and to come close to Hashem. Amar HaKadosh Baruch Hu, shall me akbil, shall elo o shall, shall elo o shall elo, right? Which one, which one is the simcha that I should accept? Which is the greater simcha? Ba'ota sha'a al-tal da'atol ha'chrivo, exactly at that moment, at that moment exactly was the thought that Hashem had to destroy the Beit HaMikdash, it seems. Hadu dichtiv ki al apiva al chamati haitali ha'irazot, a quote from the book of Yirmiyahu. Now we saw this at the end of last year, remember? That on that very night, that's when the, 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 the Malach Gavriel comes down and drives a reed or a, a beam into the ocean, which will have sediment coalesce around it and become, right, Italia shall, uh, uh, Yavan shall uh, Italia, something like that, yeah? It's going to be Greece, either it's the Greek Isles, or it's Rome, whatever it is, it's founded then. Like, that's our foundational myth. I, I don't mean it that it didn't happen. I mean myth that it's, it's a foundation story we go back to again and again, right? Again, if you want to take it literally, there's a Malach Gavriel who's some physical being. I think that countermands what the Rambam says about Malachim, but if you want to see it that way, and he showed up, humongous thing, and came down with a beam, he put it in the ground, we're making it, right? But you can understand it a different way as well, that, that the foundation stone already, sadly, of the undoing was happening exactly that moment. I'm Rabbi Hillel. Um, 
Ray Derev, there's something wrong here, but it's Kizeshu over Makamatunov. Yeah, Derevi, I think it's Derevi Valas. Kizeshu over Makamatunov Okemet Chotamo. It was like one who passes by a place that is uh, um, disgusting, the place that's a very um, uh, a dirty place, a bathroom, a sewer, something like that. So he turns his, it turns his nose away. Something smelled bad here. Something smelled bad in this uh, in this story, yeah. and and therefore it's already something something's not right, right? It doesn't pass the smell test. We would say today, Amri Chunya, Shimoni Mini Rikudim Rikta Bat Parba Ota Laila. She has eighty dances. Now, what are these dances? They're dance steps, okay. Rabbi Yitzchak ben Elazar Amar Shloshmot Mini Rikudim Rikta Bat Parba Ota Laila. Uh, uh, it's 300. Now, where do we get to? Was it 80? Was it 300? The various commentators in the matters try to explain the significance of the number 80, the significance of the number 300, whatever it is. She's doing a lot of dancing around, right? So there's a lot of, um, is this dance we saw already in the Gemara? It's, maybe it's related a little bit to Avodah Zara. She's teaching him. We saw the Gemara that she was uh, uh, taking out these, uh, these, um, these uh, instruments and uh, she was explaining to him, this is how we play music to idolatry. Now, I'm sure he was reasoning. That's how I have to learn so I can know how to counter it with our own tunes, with our own way. Yeah, but there was a certain corrosive impact of all of this. Yeah? And then the Madras goes on to say the following. He slept until the fourth hour of the day. And the keys of the Beit HaMikdash were under his head. So he slept in and he has the... Um, he has the keys of the Beit Mikdash under his head. People who are more familiar with the, um, uh, the halachic side of this will understand the next line. The king normally slept until the fourth hour, and therefore uh, uh, you have to give the Tamish al Shacha, the Korban Tamid, the Beit Mikdash, within the first four hours. But he was sleeping. And he held the keys to the Beit Mikdash, where under his pillow in his bedroom with Bat Paro, and there lies the problem. So how did it happen that he, so to speak, slept in? Remember David Amelach, according to the Gemara, is getting up in like the middle of the night, and, 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 he's, and he's, he's davening, and then he's, right? So what's going on? Not Shlomo. Shlomo stays up late, but then he sleeps in. Haketzad, asatlo kemin paras. I mean, just this image itself is worthy of like a tableau someone should draw the picture of, uh, um, if not for the halachic problems of drawing constellations and stars, but just like this scene, she made for him a canopy on his bed. And the canopy on the bed had a decoration on the top of constellations and stars. So the wisdom of Bat Paro is she wants him to see, but maybe also a little bit to be beguiled by the beauty of looking up at the stars above his bed, to study them, to know them. Kochavim are stars, Mazalot are constellations, and she spread it out above him. But just that image of it's spread out above him, above his bed, under him is the keys to the Beit HaMikdash, above him there are these stars. Right? It's almost a little bit reminiscent, and I don't know, I didn't see any commentaries that go down this road of who, who sleeps with some part of the Beit HaMikdash under his head with the stars above him. Hmm? So now many, many, many generations later, he's sleeping, the keys are under his head, and on top of him is the stars, not real stars, but the picture of the stars. When he wanted to get up, he kept seeing them. It was a great work of art. He thought it was still nighttime. He's in a personal planetarium. Again, why are Chazal telling us this? He was beguiled by her and what she had to offer. Uh, and is that just a, a passion, a, 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 you know, a passionate a romantic element? Or is there also something else over here? Ah, she made for me the stars. I'm, I'm sleeping under the stars, yet I'm indoors. I have a control over this. I understand it better. Yeah. So, but he was fooled in a way. Now, was she doing it for that reason? Or was she doing it because she loved him and wanted him to have a beautiful bed? What is it? It's of no moment to me. The point is he, he lost his bearings of night and day 
He lost his bearings of the schedule, of the time, what he had to do, of his responsibilities. He stayed up late watching uh, Bat Paro do her dances and, again, the Gemara playing him certain kinds of music. Um, and the idea that on that very night, it's, the, it's, the, it's the, the first time he drank wine in a long time. He had a low tolerance threshold. And he, he slept in, etc. Now watch what happens. Nichnesa imo v'hochichato. His mother had to come in and give him tochacha. Now his mother, of course, is Batsheva. What are you doing in bed so late? Get up. There's things we have to do, right? So there's, uh, there's, there's, there's something here for, for consideration, right? And, um, and, and, and uh, just to, to Larry's point, you wrote this strong, strong uh, sexual imagery here. Yeah, absolutely. What is this madrash, if not in a certain way, the undoing of all that is, uh, it's the counterpoint, it's the, the, the cracked mirror edition of a certain book that Shlomo Melech himself wrote as an allegory for love between the human being and Hashem. His mother comes in and his mother gives it to him. His mother. What does it mean, his mother? His mother, who is the, the, the voice, so to speak, of his father. You're getting yourself in trouble over here with some kind of a liaison that should not be. And you're neglecting what you need to do. If you look in Sefer uh, Kohelet, uh, excuse me, Shir Hashirim, you will find that it describes that the king had a crown that was made for him by his mother. Ba'atara she'itrolo imo, his mother. We don't have time to see it. If you open oh, Shir Hashirim, right? The crown that was made from by his mother. So in the mashal, there's a king, and the king has a mother, and the mother makes him a crown, and the crown that he wears, the crown from his mother, means that there's a continuity intergenerationally, et cetera. But the nimshal is very challenging, isn't it? The nimshal is very, what does it mean? God has a mother? We don't believe it. What does that mean? Chazal said, no, no, no. It's a nimshal. It's a mashal and a nimshal. The nimshal is that the crown is made, don't read it as she'itro lo imo, but rather she'itro lo umato, God's nation makes him a crown through tefillah, through the observance of mitzvot, etc. Nichnasa ima v'hochichato. His mother came in. I wonder if it doesn't also mean a certain level. His mother, as representative of the nation, came in. And why do I think that? Because of the next sentence. V'yesh omrim, Yeroven ben Nevat, nichnas v'hochicho. Yeroven ben Nevat came in and he gave it to him. You're the king? This is how the king acts? on the night of the, uh, of the you know, after the inauguration of the Beit HaMikdash, with all the celebration, and tomorrow, you know, it's going to be a, a Corbin has to be offered, and it's going to be late because of you. And he had the capability to do it. So uh, Rabbi Chagi says, name Rabbi Yitzchak, what did Rabbi Benavad do? He gathered together 80,000 from his Shevet, and he brought them in a delegation. Now, literally, but consider consider the idea that he's telling everybody and now Shlomo the same day that he did the Beit HaMikdash did you notice that Bad Paro is ensconced right there she lives right there near the he's competing there are two competing loves over here so right this pas who's that from your, your so I, I put this here I gave it to you uh, the Pasuk from Hosea, when Ephraim spoke with trembling, he became exalted in Israel. He became guilty through Baal, he died. Who spoke with trembling? Who is Ephraim? Who is that? Kedvar, kedvar Ephraim Retet, Kedavar Yeravam, all right? Ritetun Shel Shlomo. He came to shake things up with regard to Shlomo. Amar Kodesh Baruch Hu. Lama Ata At Mochicho. Why are you prosecuting him, re re rebuking him? Nasihu, Nasihu be Yisrael. Right? He's, he's, the, he's the king of no business of rebuking him. Uh, by your life, I will give you a taste of his authority and his rulership just a little bit, and you won't withstand it. You'll be a terrible Russia. You'll, you'll fall much farther and much faster, and it'll be much worse. And what happens in the end, right? We came guilty of the Baal. 
he died. We'll get to your own and everything that he does. There's obviously a question here about agency and what, what is it that your own benefit did or didn't do, et cetera. Right. And the, to, to, you know, if we're going to see he's kind of installed. So if he's kind of installed as the next king of something, how did it happen that he's also going to be held to be to blame? Right. How did, how did that happen? So filling out this portrait, the Gemara in Sanhedrin says, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, why did he merit becoming the king? On what account? He rebuked Shlomo. In the Madrash, we see what the rebuke was. Again, you can dramatize this as literally he broke into the bedchamber, part of the curtains, and said to Shlomo, excuse me, this, this is what the king does, right? Or you could understand it that he brought a delegation of 80,000 protesters, and they came in, they burst in. Were the tribe of Ephraim, were very important. Yeshua Binun is from Ephraim. Yosef ahem, ahem, is from Ephraim. Yosef, who withstands these temptations, who withstands the temptation of the daughter or the wife of someone, etc. And we'll look at you. I'm making this up, but this is the kind of arguments you imagine an Ephraimite is making. Or he got 80,000 people together and he stood outside the palace or even in the Shevet Ephraim's territory and said, this is the king. Now, he didn't necessarily know 100% what's going to the bedchamber. The point was, he could surmise. And the point was, this is what, what we have here. So writes the Gemara, Rabbi Yochanan, at Shlomo, why was he punished? He rebuked him in public. This is how he raised up his hand against the king Shlomo. He built the Milo and he closed up the breach in the city of David, his father. I thought that was positive. Amar lo said Yeravam to Shlomo, David avicha paratz pirtsot bachoma kedeshiyal yisol regel. Your father David broke those made those breaches so that the children of Israel could come up to serve God in the holidays. You did this in order to make some kind of a, 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 of a toll collection for the daughter of Paro? I don't know. I would have thought that, like a Jew says all the time, we take out the Torah, the building of Chomot Yerushalayim is a good thing. He turned it on its head. He inverted the good. He showed that it was really bad, right? And he pegged it again and again on it so you could raise taxes at the gates so you could build beautiful things for your precious Egyptian wife. What does it mean? He lifted up his hand against the king. He took off his tefillin in front of him. He lifted up his hand. means he took off his tefillin. So let's see inside Rashi. Rashi, he rebuked him. It'll explain what it is that he rebuked. The rebuke over here, by the way, in the Gemara is about the city. It's not about the bedchamber. In the Medrash's edition, it's about the bedchamber. So in one case, it's much more about the relationship itself. Another one, it's about the, the money. It's about the restriction of the people from their religious, right? There's a religious element, like you stopping them from doing what they need to do according to the mitzvahs. And you built a Beit HaMikdash, but you made it harder for them for the benefit of some ulterior motive. Terrible, disgusting. Yeah, so he, he stuck the, he knew where to stick the knife. Why, why did he get punished, Rashi says? He embarrassed him. He shamed him in public. That's the circular brackets are always ignored. The square brackets are the manuscripts we follow. So that, that they can go in easily, right? So two ideas here. I learned from my rabbi, Rashi says, one interpretation that it's so that the, the pilgrims could go through the gates so you would know who's going in and you'd be able to hit them up for money for Bat Paro. Lishna Achrina, another approach of understanding this is Shesagara Sha'arim. You close the gates. Vasam Migdal Bat Paro Min Sha'arim. One of the gates was closed, sealed. And there you made the tower for the daughter of Paro. Vukulam Ovrim Derech Sham. You made a, you forced everyone who wants to go to Shalayim 
to pass under her tower, which means to pass under her authority, to honor her, to serve her. Because kol avodat beit hamelach kari anagria, because the whole of the service of the of the king is called the anagria, not just to enhance the treasury for her benefit, but to serve her, to show her dominion. You almost put the daughter of Paro on the throne like you, and you made that the access, her and her culture and her religion and everything, and you were drawing hearts away from Hashem. Is that really what we want from our main? You see where the click, click, click is going to go? The gears are, are moving? Because we know what's, gonna, what's your oven benefit going to set up? Another religious center. You want me to go to that disgusting shul? I'm not going to that place. I'll make my own breakaway. It's much nicer. And you know what? We're not going to be about the money. We're not going to be about, you know, the, 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 um, the other forces that we have to contend with of, of, uh, of, of idolatry. Now, of course, when we look at the total picture, we scratch our heads and say, that's preposterous. The man made, you know, calves of some sort. That, that doesn't sound kosher at all. It's crazy. But at least the argument and the click, 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 why we're not going to do that thing in Yerushalayim anymore with that eyesore of a tower, you can understand where it comes from. Next, Lishna Achrina. The minig of Shlomo was, it's not just that I opened the Beit HaMikdash the first time, I'm opening it every day. I keep the keys. I'm the key master. Without me, nobody goes to davening. So what's that about? That power? The king's supposed to sleep to the third hour. He saw Omdi and Al-Hazara and the, 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 the Jewish people uh, are in the Azara in the temple precincts till the king arrives. They're waiting. Why? So they can do the Korban Tamid Shel Shachar. But he didn't materialize. The first day he slept in. Why? <laughs> Beguiled by Bat Paro, music of Bat Paro, dances of Bat Paro, right? And if Amr lo Yeravam, and Yeravam said to him, Atarot says, itnu lecha anag le Bat Paro, right? Uh, you want that they should be serving serving by power so that when they pay her off then you give them the keys so you understand what happens here now uh, he closed it up he gave uh, the whole wall right uh, uh, um, uh, uh, he, he put a tower and all the people who serve her were all there that's already he lifted up his hand against the king that's what he did with speech but the other rendering is he lifted up his hand has something to do with tefillin what does that mean? He, he, it's the, that Yeravim uh, uh, took off his tefillin in front of the king. He should have turned away out of respect and reverence for the king. You don't just get undressed in front of the king. He should have done it not in front of the king, but he didn't care. He showed a brazenness. He rim yad, lifted up his hand to take off his tefillin in front of the king. I don't have to stay dressed in front of you. Right? There's a certain etiquette. Think about the Kohen Gadol and Abed Mikdash, et cetera. So in kings, kings and queens general, there's an etiquette, a protocol, how you dress, how you stand, what you do. You don't do common things like taking off your tefillin, which in the olden days, of course, certainly in those days, they were the tefillin the whole day. It was the thing I was tefillin for. Lishna achrina, cholets tefillin b'fanav, lavo leterem kenegde b'chazaka, lahatris kenegde b'chazaka. He, 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 he took off his tefillin to show that he's, he's really going to do this. He's getting, he's getting, he revved up. To go with strength, so he took off the tefillin to show I'm I'm going to speak very harsh words right now. I'm taking them off. It's the physical equivalent of when people know what they're about to say, which is egregious and wrong and shouldn't come out of their mouth. They say, "Rabbi, please forgive me." But, and then they then they say some curse word. This is some terrible thing. You're like, "What?" Then don't say, "Rabbi, please forgive me." Don't say it. Or 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 worse than that, which is also mind boggling. God, God should forgive me for saying such a thing in a shul, but don't say it. What did he do? He took off his tefillin. I got to tell you something, right? I, you feel the rage, right? How he does. Chalat Tfilav, according to another opinion, Chalat Tfilin, a nachon liyot begilu rosh lifna melech. It's not appropriate to be begilu rosh. He took off, he, he uh, uncovered his head. You stand in front of the king, your head covered. And uh, uh, he, he, he did this. Now look in the square brackets. He did this to show that he's not acting like the king. 
He said, it's like uh, Lahabdol charades. So to him, you're not being the king now. Look at all these, you know, you would buy power and the whole thing. Ta-da, you're losing your crown. You haven't been wear a crown yet, but he has a crown he could show him. What's the crown? The crown, Davka of that Hashem gave Oter Yisrael Batifara. God crowns the Jewish people with splendor. Now, give me two more minutes to do what they say, Elenin. We're just going to read Pshat. And I want you to see the word now against this backdrop, because Yeravam is the end of a process of cascading. But before we even get there, we find out that all is not well with the... Um, with the, uh, the, 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 the surrounding environment, suddenly there's a crumbling that's going on. I don't think it was one night, the same night, but the point is it's, it's, it's accretive. And, and here's all the things that were happening geopolitically. I'm, I'm back on the source sheet on page one, just to look at the map so you know where things are. So I'm zooming in on the map. There's Har HaZetim uh, in the middle of the map, and you have a place called Sereda, sort of central, central area of the country. And then if you look up to the top right, you'll see where Damascus is. Right, and obviously, and there's Aram, and on the bottom you have Midbar, Paran, etc. Okay, you have sort of a lay of the land to remind you to refresh your memory about the geography, because as we will see now, it's going to be going right down, right across, right across the map. Right. Um, so let's 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 see it. Uh, let let's let's see it inside. Okay. So look look with me uh, at at this, and we'll see inside. Verse fourteen. Vayakam Hashem. Look at the next word. Satan lishlomo et hadad haadomi mizera hamelech hu beedom. If you've been following sort of the progression over many many weeks and months, this will now be another dalliance of Shlomo Hamelech with the Satan. But the Satan, again, not the one from Western culture, and not the one even the imagery of which is described in the Book of Eov and other places. But the Satan has a name. You know the Satan is? His name is Hadad Ha'adomi. Mizera HaMelech Hu Be'edom. He's all the way in Edom. Vayhi biyot David et Edom, ba'alot, yo'av, sar et sava, lekaber et ha'chalalim, v'yach kol zachar be'edom. We don't have time to see the story inside. We'll come back next time, Lina, there, to see, like, what was this story? Because it's mysterious what it is. So we find things out in retrospect that we didn't even know about when it actually happened. But it's something to do with, with, um, uh, 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 Yoav going up to to, uh, to 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 bury those who were killed in a war, and what did he do? He killed all the men in uh, in Edom. He sheishet chod Hashem yashav sham Yoav v'chol Yisrael adi chuk kol zachar beEdom. They occupied Edom uh, until he killed all the all the men folk off. Vayivrach adad hu v'anashim adomim of the Aviv ito lavo mitzrayim v'hadad nar katan. Where was he? He was biding his time in Egypt. Paran, around the Sinai desert area. Who's married to the daughter of Paro? Or who's married to someone related to Paro in this case? His sister-in-law, the sister-in-law of the king, right? The, the queen's sister is married to this little boy who grew up, Hadad, who has a score to settle with the Jews from David's time. And who's married to the daughter of Paro? Shlomo. You see how complex it is. But, to, but you see that Paro really loved uh, uh, Hadad because he married him off to Tachpanes. But Teilo Tachpanes. That's his name, Genuvat. Genuvat was raised in the house of Paro. He's trained in the ways of Egypt. He knows what to do, like Egyptians do. And he's in the house of Paro. I want to go back home to Edom today. Approximately Saudi Arabia, approximately, but not exactly, but in that vicinity, southern Jordan, northern Saudi Arabia. I want to go home. Yoav's dead. David's dead. The news reached, arrived. And Vayomer uh, Loparo, Kimata Chaseri Mi, Bin Chamva Keshalach Edel Artsach, Vayomer, Lo, Kishalach Deshalcheni. I want to go home. I want to bring things back. I'm basically the survivor from Edom. I'm building things up. I want to go back home. So he did. It sounds like he did. 
or at least he's asking the Melech Paro for permission. And you see how powerful Paro must be because he's telling other nations, um, uh, um, princes, what they can and can't do. Verse 23, Vayakem Elohim lo Satan et rezon ben el yada asher barach me'et hadad ezer mel tzuva adonav. So we have another guy, and he's another Satan. Less information about him. But he ran away from Haddad Ezer Mel Tsova. That's where Damascus is, that area. That Tsova is actually a little bit farther north, around Tsova. Alav Anashim, Davidotam. He was what? He was a commander of forces, of troops, when David killed them. Damasek, Damasek. He was the new person in Damasek. You understand? You understand how the word Satan is coming up again and again? The Satan is not metaphysical. These are these are people who had scores to settle and they were biding their time. In one case, under the thumb of, of Paro, unrelated now to Paro. And in the other case, up to the north. You have Lahavdol, Egypt to the south and Syria to the north. And they're getting ready for their moment when they're going to strike. By he said, verse 25, by he Satan li Israel, kol yemei shlomo. So we have um, Hadad. He's uh, massing his troops. He's getting ready. Where is he? He's also, he's up there in the north. So from the south, there's a war of attrition. And from the north, there's a war of attrition. From the south, they're firing over, you know, one, one way. And the other way, they're lobbing uh, projectiles down from their heights. And it turns out that even though we heard a story that was picture perfect until now, picture perfect, Shlomo, the zenith of everything, in the background, you should also know that uh, the, all the days of Shlomo, this was an obstacle. This was something that was a Satan. A Satan is that which opposes, which is the obstacle, which is the, uh, the, the translation in Koran, adversary, the enemy. That's what the Satan means. Satan, 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 Satan. Now, all of these things were held at bay until Shlomo fell down. Then they were all waiting in the wings. Now we come to Pasuk Chavav, and we find out about the birthplace of our antagonist to be Am Ben Nevat Efrati Min Tsureda Min Hatsureda, excuse me. Vishem Imo Tsirua Isha Almana Eved Lishlomo Vayarem Yad Ba Melech. And where is he from? Tsereda. Where is that? Look on the sheet. Middle of the area of Ephraim. And that's where he's from. And that's what he's going to do. And he raises up his hand against, uh, against uh, 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 Shlomo. And his mother is a widow. And his mother works for Shlomo. She's a servant to Shlomo. Literally or figuratively, that's his life story. My mother's an almana, and she has to be a servant to Shlomo. And he raised up his hand against the king. This is the matter of what it means that he lifted up his hand against Shlomo. Right? Bamelech, excuse me, how he raised up his hand against the king. This is what he said. The criticism was, Shlomo banayat hamilo. Sagar Peretz Ir David Aviv. What is the Milo? So various understandings. It seems to be Har Hazetim area. That was where the Bat Paro had her place. Others maintain it's actually related to the Harabayit and on the way from the Harabayit to Ir David, smack dab there. That's where it was placed. But this complex is called the Milo. We talked, it came up already earlier a few times in the Tanakh. He built this and he closed up the Peretz Ir David Aviv. Again, two things that could have been viewed very positively, but he used them, that's what we were seeing in the Gemara, as cudgels with which to beat uh, 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 Shlomo up. Right? He turned the good into the bad. And he found the weak points and he exploited them. Yosef. <laughs> Yeravam was a strong man. Shlomo saw that this was a, a na'ar, a na'ar, not in the pejorative sense, though, but that somehow he was, with youthful exuberance, 
and maybe with charisma. Yeah. And of course, I think not accidental, the same Pasuk refers to Beit Yosef and Nar. Yosef, who Nar, Ibn Bilhav, Ibn Zilpa, maybe something having to do with his charisma and his looks, etc. Kiyosem he's a go-getter. Ooh, I like this guy. He's got strength. He's got uh, charisma. He's got guts. You know what I'll do? I'll make him in charge. I'll give him a job. You could just hear the first pages of a much later book, Team of Rivals, being written. Team of Rivals, Doris Kearns, Kearns Goodwin, Lahavdal. Shlomo says, I'm, I'm not going to put him out. I'm not going to have him killed. Didn't he raise a hand against you? You know what? Criticism's well taken. I got to do tshuva. But I give you a job. That's how much I trust you. Or maybe he didn't know about any of these criticisms. They're all uh, happening under the radar. He doesn't know. And now as a result of not knowing what happens, he doesn't realize, Shlomo, that unfortunately he's unwittingly putting him in a place of power. A lot more to say on this. The parallels, Yeravam, Ben Nevat, and Avshalom, Ben David, and sort of positioning himself as creating a block between the king and the people, having things to do also in the case of Avshalom, is also about taxes. And I mentioned then, and I could say now, we'll come back to it, that's going to be one of the issues, it's going to be taxation. It's going to be one of the main sticking points of why the, 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 uh, the, uh, the split happens, this, the, this um, uh, uh, basically civil disunion uh, and, and, and uncoupling how that's going to go. Uh, but we'll see that, I guess, next uh, next we learn. What we didn't get to, of course, today is verses 29 through 43, which we'll have to pick up next we learn uh, uh, to try to understand this a little more uh, in depth. Again, we will most likely not have a shear next Thursday, but instead we will reconvene, God willing, in two Thursdays from now. Haba'ale and Litova. I wish everyone a great day and uh, continued uh, great learning. See you soon.